I'm Tim Tao, director of the Charles S. Roberts Awards. Thank you so much for attending this year's presentation of the Charles S. Roberts Awards, recognizing excellence in the conflict simulation industry. These awards have been issued annually since 1975, and were the brainchild of John Mansfield. The awards are named after Charles S. Roberts, the original founder and operator of the Avalon Hill Game Company. The awards themselves are not chosen by any small committee, but are chosen by you, the voters. The top vote recipient in each category is named the winner, with next four highest vote recipients be named nominees. Now, to the host of our show, Dan Pancaldi, a wargaming, musical, multimedia, polymath. Dan hosts the No Enemies Here podcast on YouTube and is not only the host, but also the producer of this year's 2020 Charles S. Roberts Awards. Take it away, Dan. You know, I'm, ed I'm, I'm editing right now. Eh? And yeah, we're going to get into the formalities and we're going to get all snooty and uptight and all that, you know, because these are the Charles S. Robert Awards. We call them the Charlies. But uh, there's some of you chitlins out there, you young guys. You don't know who Uncle Charlie is. So I made a little, a little filmette, as you can say, with my music, of course. You know what I mean? Nepotism. Mm. But what I want to say is that the reason why you're playing these type of war games right now is really truly because of him, Uncle Charlie. So you know what? Before we start the show, relax. Go to the fridge, get yourself your favorite beverage. Watch the little bio clip I did. And then we're going to get right into it. Enjoy the Charlies. Hello fellow gamers, Alan Rothberg here to introduce the first category for the 2020 Charles S. Roberts Awards for games published in 2019. The category is Ancients to Pre-Napoleonics. This period is the largest of all the time spans of the historical periods. There are five finalists and one winner. The five finalists in alphabetical order are Command and Colors, Medieval, Designer Richard Borg, GMT Games, Freeman's Farm, 1777, designer Maurice Suckling, publisher Worthington Games, Imperium Romanum, designer Al Nofi, publisher Decision Games, Nevsky, designer Volko Runke, GMT Games, and Peloponnesian War, Mark Herman, GMT Games. The top vote getter of these five finalists is Nevsky by Volko Runke. Congratulations to him, the entire design and publication team behind that game. Hi, I'm Volko Runke, designer of Nevsky, and I am very happy to accept the award for the design Nevsky as best pre-Napoleonic war game. I want to accept the award on behalf also of GMT Games uh, and everyone there who had the faith in me and the patience to work on this project and a special thanks to artists Chechu Nieto Sanchez and Paul Dobbins and Pavel Tatarnikov uh, uh, whose work among those of, of many others made Nevsky I think such an attractive product. I'd also like to thank my eagle-eyed developer Wendell Albright 
before seeing to it that we ended up with a virtually errata free product. I am surprised and delighted at how uh, widely Board War Gamers have accepted this somewhat off the beaten path topic and treatment and I happily accept the award of a Charlie for Nevsky. Thank you all so much. Our next presenter is Fred Serval. Actually, Fred, I consider him a friend of mine. He's also the designer of Red Flag Over Paris, the, uh, the, the, the Rise and Fall of the Paris Commune, it's gonna be on GMT, and Fred, Fred's an intellect. And he, he's got strong opinions, I mean, what Frenchman doesn't have, but I digress. Great guy, super intellect, I think he builds blocks for, for a living. I don't know. But anyways, here he's going to be presenting, as he's going to tell you, his favorite subject. But he's going to go on. I mean, his favorite category. And, well, ladies and gentlemen, that wasn't much of a huge description of Fred, because Fred is more than Fred. Ladies and gentlemen, Fred Serval. Hi, I'm Fred Serval. War game designer and YouTuber, I have the privilege of presenting you the Pièce de Résistance, the crown jewel of the awards, the best Napoleonic era war game. It's my favorite era, it's the most interesting one, it's the most diverse, I love it. I'm actually even wondering why do we have other awards? The best Napoleonic war game is going to be the best war game anyway. But let's jump into it and let's talk about the five nominees. And this year's first nominee is La Bataille de Botsen 1813, released by Marshall Enterprise, a publisher that is specialized in Napoleonic era war games. This is a monster hex and counter game with more than 1100 counters. That's massive. The game is designed by Jason Soto and Denis A. Spores. And the game includes the whole battle, obviously, as a campaign, but also three smaller scenarios uh, of battles surrounding the main one. Nominee number two is Moravian Sun published by Asias Edizioni, a very interesting Italian publisher. This game is designed by Enrico Acerbi, that is also the artist on that specific game. It uses the Vive la France Empire rule system to simulate the great Napoleon triumph of 1805, the Battle of Rostovitz. Personally, a topic that I never get bored playing. Nominee number three is Napoleon Retreats, Campaign in France Part 2 by Kevin Zucker. Kevin Zucker is a designer that has been designing Napoleonic war games for more than 40 years now. A huge amount of experience, a great designer. And this specific game has been released by Operational Studies Group. This design focuses on March 1814, uh, when Napoleon was retreating in front of Blücher. The Empire was on the verge of collapse, and the game concentrates on three main battles that happened on the first half of March. The Battle of Craon on the 6th, the Battle of Lens on the 10th of March, and finally the Battle in Reims on the 13th. You can also play all the three battles in a big campaign mode. Nominee number 4 is 4 bar 1815 Last Eagles by French publisher Exasim and designed by the awesome Walter Vejdovsky. This game is part of a series called Eagles of France that covers, for now, four major battles of the Napoleonic era. Quatre is a battle that happens two days before Waterloo, confronting Ney with Wellington, that was tactical victory for the coalition and a strategic victory for the French army. This is a very interesting system that focuses on troop morale, attrition, and has this very exciting end-of-turn mechanic. And finally, last but not least, nominee number five. Waterloo Campaign 1815, published by RBM Studio, the legendary publisher behind Wargame magazine C3i. This one is designed by the also very legendary Mark Herman, the brilliant mind behind Empire of the Sun, SPQR, or We the People. This light operational war game focuses on the whole campaign of Waterloo and uses the same system that was used the year before for Gettysburg, a very innovative and interesting approach to hex and counter operational wargaming. And now it is time to announce this year's winner of the Charles S. Roberts Award of the Best Napoleonic Era War Game. And the winner is Cadbra 1815 by Exasim and Walter Wyszdowski. I would like to congratulate them for this 
amazing award and I would like to thank all of you for supporting those five great amazing games. And now, a word from the winners. Hello, I'm Walter Wadowski, designer of the Eagle of France series. I'd uh, like to give a warm thank you from France uh, for those who voted for Quatre Bras, who received this 2019 CSR award for Napoleonic board games. I'd like to give you in a few words uh, the reason why I started to design this series five years ago. Quatre Bras is the fourth title uh, in the series, started in 2015 for the bicentenary of Waterloo. I wanted to have uh, nice looking games, uh, regiment level, 200 meters per X, um, and playable in uh, less than one day. Uh, Quatre Bras is of course uh, compatible with Lini and you can play the whole battle of June 16. So again, thank you very much, very happy to have CSR recognition for this series. Goodbye. Goodbye. Ah ben merci Fred. À la prochaine, hein? très bien fait, très bien fait. Yes. Uh, our next presenter is Andy Lokes. Andy Lokes, I know of designed a game called Waning Crescent, Shattered Cross, The Siege of Malta, 1565. You know, that's not obscure. I mean, look at Nevsky. But anyways, and also Toulon, 1793. And he will be presenting the post-Napoleonic games. Andy? Andy? Hello, my name is Andy Lopes and I've been asked to present the nominees and winner for the 2019 Charles S. Roberts Awards in the category of Best Post-Napoleonic to Pre-World War II Era Board War Game. And the nominees are Brave Little Belgium by Orion Heilman and Dave Shaw and published by Holland Spiel. Crusade and Revolution by David Gomez Areloso and published by Compass Games. Custosa by Andrea Brusatti and published by Europa Simulazioni. Death Valley by Greg Loback and published by GMT Games. And finally, Triumph of Chaos, the Deluxe Edition by David Doctor and published by Clash of Arms Games. And I'm pleased to announce that the winner is Death Valley by Greg Lobach and published by GMT Games. My congratulations to Greg and to all at GMT on this win. Thank you. I'm Greg Lobach, the designer of Death Valley Battles for the Shenandoah. I'm grateful for and honored by the selection of Death Valley as the Charles S. Roberts Game of the Year for post-Napoleon to World War II period. A project like this has many contributors. I would like to thank Bill Byrne for his invaluable help as developer, Alan Dickerson for his tireless work on the Vassal modules, and the playtest team for the critical efforts to improve the game. At GMT, I'd like to thank Gene Billingsley and Tony Curtis for their patience and encouragement, and Charlie Kibler for his excellent graphics work. Finally, I would like to thank Richard Bird for the opportunity. He is missed. Thank you all, and God bless. Salve amigos! The next presenter is a real Roman. Unlike me, I'm more of a Tuscan. But anyways, Riccardo Mazzini, a historian, an author, polylinguist, probably a great chef, and just put out his new game, 
Guerra di Carta. Not a new game, I should say. A new book! And he learned how to play war games with his dad. And it's co-authored with his dad. I mean, what I would have to have that. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, Ricardo Massini. Wally. Hello, Ricardo Massini here. And from Rome, Italy, welcome to the best World War II era war game category for the 2020 Charles S. Roberts Awards. Let's get to the nominees. The first, the first one, BCS Brazen Chariots Battles for Tobruk by Dean Essig and Jim Daniels for MMP. A very peculiar system which stands just in the middle between tactical and operational simulations. As the ancient Romans said in Medio Stat Virtus, Virtue stands just in the middle, and Brazen Chariots. Oh, if I love that title. Then, Last Hundred Yards by Mike Denson for GMT Games. A tactical game that came as a shock to some wargamers because, you know, soldiers don't like to be shot at, and getting shot at is a good motivation to get moving and become more active. Once again, what a shock. The third nominee is another GMT title, Stalingrad 42. Mark Simonich creates a good old-fashioned accent counter war game to remind us why we love so much good old-fashioned accent counter war games, especially those that show us why going to Stalingrad was actually not such a good idea. And again, U-Boat the board game by Bartosz Pluta and Arthur Salvarowski for Iron Wall Studio. An app-enhanced game in which plotting your course and executing proper torpedo runs and convoys is as important as cooking bread, cheese and having fruits and vegetables. And then what a spaghetti anyone? And finally, Wings of the Motherland by JD Webster for Clash of Arms, an Eastern Frontier combat war game as much as in economic games. Economy of speed, altitude and especially Ammo Expenditure. Now, these are all great games, don't you think? But only one can be a winner for this category. And the winner is... Who bought the board game by Iron Wolf Studio? Hello. This is Artur Salvarovsky from Iron Wolf Studio. I have been asked to recall this video for you because you both the board game has won the Charles S. Roberts Award for the best World War II era board war game. I guess we can all agree that you both is not a typical war game in the traditional sense of the term. It is probably as different from your typical war game as it could be, and we might even go as far as, as to say that it's a whole different take on the war gaming. And perhaps this is something that uh, actually appealed to uh, the voters. Uh, but uh, as you already know, we set out with the idea of creating something unique. Uh, at the same time, we wanted to imbue our game with as much theme as possible on a variety of levels from the theater of operations and how it evolved, through the use of weapons and tactics, um, to how German submariners lived, what they ate, how they slept, what illnesses they were prone to, and so much more. And being genuine World War II fans, uh, we wanted U-Boat to convey the reality of this particular fighting unit. Uh, and it seems that we have managed to achieve that, at least to some degree. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank everyone who voted for our game. This particular award really means a lot to us, uh, because in fact Iron Wolf Studio was founded with World War II games in mind, and we are already working on our further projects in this setting. Uh, I sincerely hope that everybody who likes u boat will keep following what we do, and that you will be excited about our next games as much as you have been about u boat this is just a great news. We've just received a Charlie for the best second World War War game. This would never ever happen if not more than 8,000 people who supported us at the Kickstarter. Thank you all. Ubot is now available all across the world, even in Germany, which required some guts from our German partner Pegasus. Thank you. There are more second World War games at Phalanx and you may find it out at our website. This is a great feast for us, 
which wouldn't be possible without the people at the that Iron Wolf Studio and Phalanx, without the designers Bartosz Pluta, Artur Salvarowski, Chris Claw, who did the art on the box, and Valdemar Gumienny, who was the author of a 3D submarine that you enjoy playing. And least, last but not least, Michał Ozan. You know, when I was studying in school, I was at the college level, right? Studying music, and I'm 22 years old. And you know, you think you're hot poop. Uh, being a musician, you know, you're good. The, the arrogance is unbelievable. But anyways, youth is wasted on the young. So anyways, uh, my teacher says, hey, we're gonna go to the uh, Montreal Symphony Orchestra and we're gonna listen to a young uh, violinist. Uh, um, I forget her name. Ling, Lin Ling or something like that. Anyways, she was an Asian lady, and I said, "Oh, wow, young lady, yeah, like how young? Ten. I thought ten. What are you gonna do when you're ten? What do you know when you're ten? You're ten. I mean, I'm I'm st I'm still eating uh, uh, bugs and grasshoppers and dirt. I haven't even taken a bus yet. At ten years old." Anyways, I'm incredibly skeptical, and not even skeptical, for sure, this is going to be crap. But she's playing with the MSO, you know what I'm saying? Which is a world-renowned orchestra. Anyways, the music starts, it's the orchestra. This is a violin concerto. It's the orchestra. Then the orchestra quiets down, and she plays. And upon listening to that first note... Just that first note, and it was just like a held sustained note. She had so much life that I'll never have that much life. I mean, I'm 56. I don't have that much life. She was 10, and that note, that note, unbelievable. Not often you see people like that. Here's our next guest. is my first board game which I designed during the COVID lockdown. The game aims at educating about present pandemic in an entertaining way. The game spreads awareness about wearing masks, social distancing and quarantine. The game also promotes yoga and appreciates our COVID warriors. With extensive support from all, we could design, publish, and launch our board game on Amazon in a record time of 45 days. The details about my game is available on Board Game Geek site. My upcoming games are on tourism and naval battleships, which would be launched soon. Now, coming to the Charles S. Uh, Roberts uh, Awards. The nominees for Best Amateur or Print and Play Board War Game are as follows. Nominee 1, Battles for the Pacific. Battles for the Pacific is a low complexity, two player turn based war game which is designed to reflect the key strategic and tactical aspects of naval and land warfare in the Pacific theater of operations. The main combatants in the game are the military forces of Japan and the United States of America and their allies. So the next is nominee 2, B-25 Prince of the Skies. B-25 Prince of the Skies based on the popular B-17 Queen of the Skies game. This has the same rule set, just modified for uh, B-25 different campaign settings. And next is nominee 3 which is Storm Over Dublin. Storm Over Dublin is an area or impulse game of the 1916 Easter Rising and 1922 Battle of Dublin. The rebel player must see strategic buildings across Dublin and hold them against the odds. The government player must take back control of the city block by block using cavalry, infantry, artillery, gunboats, bombers, tanks, 
armor uh, armored cars even if the city is reduced to ruins each side earns victory points for controlling areas and capturing enemy leaders and units number 4 federation teleports in the game all, all you need to do is advance level ranks receiving 11 different ship assignments while engaging in 22 different missions and acquiring up to 15 different skills you also are eligible for decorations and commendation of the highest order it is also contained on one page you roll you write hopefully you get promoted or at least leave to fight another day now only five s boat scores of the english channel It's S Boat Scores of the English Channel is a tactical level war game where you, as a captain, take the command of German Kriegsmarine type S hundred Skellen boat fast attack torpedo boat squadron in the English Channel during 1943 to 1944. Your main goal is to survive while sinking as many enemy ships. Uh, as you and your squadron can missions include offensive patrols mini laying and search and rescue missions so all the nominees best of luck hats crossed good luck thank you bye bye well veer that's that's pretty awesome and you know i have to confess something veer It's guys like you, little geniuses like you that, you know, give me, well, thank God there's hope for the future. But, you know, I, I'm a musician, Veer. Huh? And um, I actually started late in life. I started, I was 19. But I worked really hard. I became pretty good at what I did. Um, but I had to work really, really, really hard, Veer. You don't look like you had to work really, really hard, Veer. You know what I'm saying? So little, little guys like you kind of freak me out. But congratulations on your game. And I'm going to announce the winner of the print and play uh, board war games. And that is Federation Stellar Force. That's right by Robert Carroll. And Veer, here's Robert Carroll. Wow, this is a surprise and a truly great honor. I'm excited to see the Charles S. Robert Awards return after a hiatus, but even more amazed to be nominated for Best Amateur Game. I am humbled and honored to accept for Federation Stellar Force, which is the first in a series of low complexity, dice-driven, role-player-esque games uh, which are supposed to be played on one page. The One Page in a Life series, or Opal, is dedicated to my late grandmother, Opal Hamilton, who spent countless hours playing with her geeky grandson. This is truly a great honor, and I really appreciate everyone who nominated it, especially, but also those who played it, who continue to play it, who enjoy the series. That's what it's there for. That's why I posted it on Board Game Geek as a print and play. And again, thank you all. And I appreciate everything that you guys have done for me. Bye. Hey, this is Herman Luttman. I just want to say congratulations to all the nominees of the Charles Roberts Award. And ladies and gentlemen, that was Robert Carroll. I'm in touch with Robert Carroll, you know. And on my show, sometimes I have people do intros. You know, Mark Herman did an intro, hi, you're watching No Enemies Here, blah, 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 you know, <clears throat> and other people that I can't think of right now. And I asked uh, Robert, I said, Robert, uh, uh, send me an intro or something, you know? So this is what he sends me. Shut up! I have trouble with her and Harold Buchanan. They gave me the hardest times. This is Mark D. with Grognard.com, and I'm honored to present the Charles S. Roberts nominees for the Best Game Review or Analysis category. The first nominee is ArmchairGeneral.com. 
a great online resource for those interested in military history, wargaming, and strategy gaming. The talented staff includes senior online editor Rick Martin and author Ray Garvey. Armchair General has been producing top-notch content since 2003 with their in-depth game reviews, articles, and interactive debates. The next nominee is Harsh Rules, Breaking Down Board Games, a YouTube channel created and filled with video content by gamer Ben Harsh. If you're a visual learner and you want to painlessly learn how to play a game, Ben's channel should be your first stop. His instructional videos are well organized and the production quality is outstanding. Ben is obviously a frustrated uh, animator. Harsh? Maybe. But with more than 150 videos to choose from, you're sure to find something that interests you. The next nominee is the Player's Aid blog, which specializes in game reviews, playthroughs, after action reports, interviews, and top 10 lists. Site hosts Grant and Alexander burst on the scene in 2016 and quickly set new standards for written as well as video content. Throw in Solitaire Sundays and War Game Wednesdays and you've got the makings of an engaging site that keeps visitors coming back for more. The final nominee is Wojanik TV, which is Polish for Warrior TV. It's a YouTube channel that's been around for less than a year but already has a loyal following and has cranked out an impressive array of half-hour videos. Hosted by Michel Leviathan Sorbet, the videos are mostly Polish language, but he does do some in English. He also mixes it up by occasionally having a guest or a co-host. Uh, like many sites today, the production quality of Wojanik TV videos make them easy to watch. And those are the nominees for the Best Game Review or Analysis category. And the winner is the Players' Aid. Congratulations, guys. So, thank you very much for the uh, all the votes and the nominations. You guys, are, you guys are crazy. Uh, yeah, we're humbled. It's really mm -hmm. awesome. Uh, but we do this for you guys. So this award goes out to all of our um, viewers and subscribers as well, because you keep us going and help us to do this. Yeah. But uh, Charles S. Roberts Award, it, it's a great honor. So thank you very much uh, to everyone who voted for us. Well, and, and the only other comment I have is I know there's a lot of other people out there that are yeah. really good at what they do. And I think it's a testament to the to the hobby that there are so many people that are interested in doing what we do. Um, but yeah, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. We're very humbled and shocked and surprised yes. and awed. <laughs> All those words, those descriptors. So thank you very much. You know, it's hunting season. You can never be too safe when you got guys uh, like this there coming after you. So the next guy I'm going to present is also a friend of mine called Jan Heinemann. He's got a show on YouTube called Let's Play History. This guy's another n intellect. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Jan Heinemann. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to present to you today the nominees and winners of the Charles S. Roberts Awards for Excellence in the Conflict Simulation Game Industry 2019 and the computer wargame categories. Over the last 30 years, we were able to follow the development of computer or digital wargames. All sorts of games have been made, from simple to hardcore simulations. The graphics and accessibility are improving quite a lot recently, and more and more board games are getting dedicated digital adaptations too, not only in Vassal, Tabletop Simulator or other proxies, that had proven to be of huge service to the community these days, but as full-featured games. But without further ado, let's get to the games. In the category Best Modern Era War Game, we have the following nominees. Command Modern Operations is a hardcore simulation of tactical and operational naval and air operations post-World War II. Developed by Warfare Sims and published by Slytherin in November 2019, 
command modern operations and its predecessors are used for military training as well as played by engaged wargamers. The next one is Unity of Command 2. In November 2019, Unity of Command 2 brought casual operational computer wargaming to another level. Developed by Crow Team and published by 2x2 Games in November 2019, Unity of Command 2 focuses on Allied operations against the Axis in World War II in North Africa and Europe. This game is extremely accessible for new wargamers but comes with interesting in-depth mechanics built around headquarters, supply and specialized battalions. The next game is Warplan. The first game of Kraken Studios, again published by Slytherin, is a classical hex encounter World War II in the Western Theater war game that is heavily inspired by the Strategic Command series as it is developed by one of its core playtesters and expands on more unit agility. One of the few digital hex encounter games where you can split your units. And the next one is World of Tanks. The good old arcade massively online multiplayer tactical tank shooter World of Tanks in which players clash in team engagements to earn experience points which then can be used to research better equipment and new tank models. Published in 2010 by Wargaming.net, it has gotten new tank branches for Swedish, French and British vehicle classes in 2019. And the winner in the category Best Modern Era Computer Wargame is... Command Modern Operations Hello everyone, this is obviously a tremendous and a humbling honor and we thank everyone who has suggested and voted for us. They say that success has many fathers and in this case it is true. We would like to thank our families and friends for fully standing by us in this endeavor. The entire team of Warfare Sims for turning the vision into reality. Matrix Slytherin, our publishers, for supporting and enabling us every step of the way. And everyone out there, in the civilian and professional space, who believes in our vision and has helped us in one way or another. You know who you are and we are grateful. Thank you all. And the next category, ladies and gentlemen, is Best Science Fiction or Fantasy Computer War Game. The nominees are First, Battlefleet Gothic Armada 2 Developed by Tindalos Interactive and published by Focus Home Interactive in January 2019, Battlefleet Gothic Armada 2 is a real-time tactical space battle game with massive battles based on the tabletop game Gothic Armada and set in the Warhammer 40k universe. The next game in this category is Fantasy General 2. Fantasy General 2 is a hex and miniatures digital war game developed by Owned by Gravity and published by Slytherin. It is in reiteration of the classic back from the 90s. Morale and units supporting each other are the key in these turn-based fantasy battles. And third, Stellaris. The popular grand strategy game by Paradox Interactive was published in 2016, but the Lithoid Species DLC introduced a new alien race and mechanics to the game in October 2019. Space battles, planet and state management make Stellaris a solid game from the Paradox family of Crusader Kings and Europa Universalis fame. And the winner. In the category Best Science Fiction or Fantasy Computer War Game 2019 is... Stellaris with Lizard Species. And the next category, ladies and gentlemen, is Best Computer War Game Expansion or Update. And the nominee is Through the Ages, New Leaders and Wonders. Through the Ages is a digital version of the eponymous board game published by Czech Games Edition. 
It is a card drafting game in which players develop their factions through three ages of human history. The expansion or DLC, new leaders and wonders, adds new wonders and additional historical personalities to the game. And who through the ages, new leaders and wonders is our winner in the category best computer war game expansion or update. And the next category, ladies and gentlemen, is Best Computer War Game Graphics. The first nominee, Steel Division 2. After Steel Division Normandy 44, Eugène Systems has switched to the Eastern Front in World War II in June 2019. Steel Division 2 comes with massive tactical real-time battles, totally destroyable terrain and a new campaign system familiar from Eugène's war game series. Next nominee, U-Boot, the board game. Right, the board game by Phalanx. Reading this, I first thought U-Boot, the computer game, was meant, which by the way has a pretty similar art and thematic focus, but it is also not a game on its own. The companion app that you need for playing U-Boot, the board game. It provides the enemy AI for the highly acclaimed board game and in fact, for an app, it has good graphics. The next nominee is again Unity of Command 2 by Crow Team and 2x2 Games. It not only combines accessibility and neat command and supply mechanics, but also has improved on the graphics from part 1. Instead of chess-like figures, Unity of Command 2 comes with animated 3D models representing brigades, divisions and battle groups. And finally we have World of Tanks again. Well, this team seems to be an evergreen, but indeed the graphics aren't too bad, keeping in mind that it is a massively multiplayer online game. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner in the category Best Computer War Game Graphics is Unity of Command 2. Uh, hello, this is Tomislav from 2x2 Two Two Games. We are honored uh, and very happy to receive the Charles S. Roberts Award for uh, best computer uh, graphics in a war game. Um, ours is a small team. We're from Zagreb, Croatia. Um, there's about six people in the team. Um, the graphical side, uh, the kudos should definitely go to our graphics artists, Goran Mitrovic and Davor Lagovac. Um, and Again, we are super happy and thankful that um, our efforts are recognized um, and we'll do our best you know, to keep your war games pretty and fun to play in the future. This year's nominees for the best pre-20th century computer war game truly represent the span of history. The first nominee is Blocks, Julius Caesar, designed by Grant Daglish and Justin Thompson, and published by Avalon Digital. This is a replication of the tabletop block game Julius Caesar from Columbia Games. It focuses on the operational and strategic aspects of the Roman Civil War between Julius Caesar and Pompey the Great. The next nominee is Fields of Glory Empire, published by Slytherin, designed by Philippe Malikaire. Field of Glory Empire is a grand strategy game with over 70 playable factions. It spans the Middle East to Europe, beginning at the death of Alexander the Great. With a unique 15-rung civilization ladder and a non-linear technology track, you can chart your own course to make your empire rise and lay its fall. The bonus feature is the ability to integrate with Fields of Glory 2 to play out your tactical battles and import the results in the Fields of Glory Empire. Next nominee is Blocks, Richard III, designed by Tom Daglish and Jerry Taylor, and published by Avalon Digital. Richard III, The War of the Roses, is a conversion of the block game by Columbia Games, 
It covers the civil war known as the War of the Roses in England. It depicts both the vicious military campaigns and the rich political struggles that surrounded the late rule of the Mad King Henry VI, the Yorkist usurper Edward IV, and the bloody rule of the titular Richard III. A faithful recreation of the block game, it takes advantage of the computer to enhance the fog of war elements. And finally, the last nominee is Fort Sumter, the Succession Crisis, 1860-61. This game focuses on the lead up to the American Civil War. Over three turns, players battle over the four key dimensions of the crisis of arsenals, public opinion, key states, and political institutions. This game is designed by Mark Herman and published by Playdeck. Thank you to all of our nominees and the winner of the best pre 20th century computer war game is Box Julius Caesar. Now let's hear from the designer. Hello everyone, uh, greetings from Avalon Digital from France. Uh, we have been working for the last few months on the computer adaptation of uh, the very famous block game series from our friends at Columbia Games. Uh, we started a year ago with their most famous title, Richard III, uh, presented on Kickstarter and then sold on Steam. And at the end of 2019, we presented Julius Caesar, the second game from their collection. And now we have just released in early access on Steam, uh, probably the most known of their blog games, Hammer of the Scots. The uh, campaign of early access is going fine and well. And uh, we improved the game engine with the AI with many uh, feedback from the players. Um, we have just been delighted to learn that the adaptation of Julius Caesar has been nominated for the pre 20th century computer war game adaptation. And ourselves and Columbia Games are very pleased of the honor made to us. Uh, we will be most pleased to receive your votes and get the nomination. And in all case, work is continuing on the Blocks engine and we expect to give you uh, more uh, elements and more features and more nice Columbia Games adaptation on this digital engine. In all case, thanks for your support and have fun with the game. Our next presenter is Bruce Monin, who will speak about his experience he's had in the war game industry. Bruce? Hello. I have spent almost two decades in this hobby as a member of the BPA Board of Directors. I've also spent over a decade as a editor of MMP's Operations Magazine. But before those, I was editor for a decade of an amateur war game magazine called The Board Gamer. And I can tell you from personal experience, nobody publishes an amateur magazine in this hobby in an attempt to get rich. The sole reason to do it is an attempt to give back to the hobby, to make it better. So it is my honor to provide the nominees for this year's Charles S. Roberts Award for Best Amateur War Game Magazine. And these nominees are Bonsai which was founded by Matt Shostak in 1995. Bonsai was first published by the Austin Advanced Squad Leader Club and now is the newsletter of the Texas ASL Club and continues to publish player news, tournament information, and strategy tips. All issues are free and available on the web at texas-asl.com. The editorial team is Sam Tyson and Rick Reinish. Next, we have Dispatches from the Bunker, published by Vic Provost. It is the longest continuously running ASL publication that contains a scenario in each issue. Published twice a year, Dispatches now contains multiple scenarios and looks at regional ASL play in the Northeastern US and global tournament play. Subscription information can be found at yankeegamers.org backslash dispatches.php. Our third nominee is Jim Werbeneth's Line of Departure. 
This has been published quarterly since October of 1991. It is a five-time Charles S. Roberts Award winner and covers all genres of board and computer games. Supplementing the publication is a free online support site. Subscription information is available at jimwerbeneth.com backslash L-O-D. And finally, our fourth and final nominee is War Diary, edited and published by Roy Matheson. This concentrates on thoroughly examining existing games, both large and small. Each issue contains historical articles and tie-ins to gaming topics. New game scenarios, variants, and expansions. And also game and book reviews, interviews with notable gaming personalities, and articles on game strategy and good play. Subscription information is available at wardiarymagazine.com. And this year's winner is War Diary by Roy Matheson. Congratulations, Roy. I'm Roy Matheson, editor and publisher of War Diary Magazine. I wanted to thank all of you that voted for us as the best amateur wargaming magazine of the year. We're greatly appreciated. Uh, all credit really goes to the staff who does the, the wonderful articles. If you're not familiar with us, please check us out. You can see us at wardiarymagazine.com. Hi, I'm Derek Landell, and it's my privilege to present to you the 2019 Charles S. Roberts Award for Best Magazine Board Wargame. Wow, that's a mouthful of a title. Some of you may be wondering, what exactly is a magazine board war game? Well, simply put, it's just a war game that's been published in a magazine. Magazines have been a popular medium for war games as far back as the early 1970s, and it's a practice that continues still to this day. Lucky for us war gamers, there was no lack of quantity or quality in 2019 for magazine board war games. From the competition, these five gems have emerged as our nominees. Campaigns of 1777, designed by Harold Buchanan and published in the magazine Strategy and Tactics. This is a two-player game set during the American Revolution. It features the battles of Fort Ticonderoga, Fort Stanwix, as well as Brandywine, Germantown, and Saratoga. Die Atombomb, designed by Stephen Cunliffe and published in the magazine Against the Odds. Die Atombomb is a 2-5 player game that takes place during World War II in Germany. Each player is a faction in the German industry, government, or military seeking to start work on the German nuclear program. Players face numerous challenges including recruiting scientists and gathering nuclear resources. Great East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, designed by Yasushi Nakaguro and published in the magazine Special Ops. Great East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere is a two-player game covering war, diplomacy, and politics in the Asia-Pacific theater during World War II from 1939 to 1944. Pitts War, designed by Francois Stanislaus Thomas and published in the magazine Paper Wars. Pitts War is a two-player game simulating the epic struggle between the UK and France. The game begins at the dawn of the French Revolution in 1792 and culminates at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. And finally, Waterloo Campaign 1815, designed by Mark Herman and published in the magazine C3I. Waterloo Campaign 1815 is a two-player game. Players can take on the role of Napoleon and the French or the anglo allied coalition of the Duke of Wellington and Prussia's von Blücher. This campaign historically ended with Napoleon's demise at the Battle of Waterloo. Players will fight to repeat or change that outcome. So those are the nominees for the 2019 Charles S. Roberts Best Magazine Board War Game Award. Congrats to all the nominees. And the winner is, drum roll. Campaigns of 1777, designed by Harold Buchanan, published in the magazine Strategy and Tactics. To accept this award, the winning designer, Harold Buchanan. Hey gang, it's Harold. Very pleased to hear that Campaigns of 1777 has won the Charles S. Roberts Award in 2019 for the best magazine war game. It's uh, very exciting to be associated with that award and to have a game on that austere list. First, I want to thank all the people that voted, all the people that have played it, bought it, 
uh, enjoyed it, given me some feedback. Uh, that's a terrific payback for designing the game. Uh, secondly, uh, I want to thank Decision Games, Doc Cummins, Callie Cummins, Doug Johnson, who did all the development uh, on the game, did a fantastic job. Terry Leeds did the art. He continues to make me look like a better designer through his great work, and he produced, in this case, I think the best magazine war game map ever. I want to thank the San Diego crew for all their hard work play testing my games. They add value every time they touch it, and thanks, really appreciate that. And then uh, last, I want to make sure that uh, we thank the committee for all their hard work. Uh, when you resurrect an award like this, it's a lot of work, a lot of detail, a thankless job, no pay, and uh, fraught with traps, and uh, appreciate them reinvigorating an award that's been so important to our history and will be so important going forward. Thanks. Okay, here I am back at the old editing booth, okay? Probably not the same day, same hour, whatever. But you see how sweet Harold is? He's a sweetheart. Soft-spoken, debonair, good-looking guy. You know what I mean? I know him otherwise. And um, words cannot express how much I know Harold otherwise. As a matter of fact, being in the editing room, I found an old clip that I've played. Maybe some of you have seen it. Maybe some of you haven't. Here we go. Something really weird happened a few days ago. I got a phone call and it's Harold Buchanan. Wow, Harold Buchanan. I'm freaked, you know. Hey, Harold, how are you? He says, you're Dan Pincaldi? Oh, yeah. And you called my house. It's me. And then he, he lost it. He loses it. Well, I was so happy that it was Harold Buchanan. I pressed record so, you know, I can keep that conversation for posterity. This is how it went. Hello? Hello, is this Dan Pancaldi? Yes, it is. This is the No Enemies Here, Dan Pancaldi? Uh, yes, sir. Well, this is Harold Buchanan. Harold? Wow! What an honor! Dan Pancaldi? Are you wearing that stupid beep in Michigan t-shirt? What? Yeah! You take that beep in Michigan t-shirt off or I'll break your beep in head! Harold, it's just a Michigan t-shirt. You don't know nothing! You shut up! You speak only when you're spoken to, you hear me? I know people. I got friends in the Pentagon and I got friends in the CIA. I can either bomb you or I can snipe you. So you take that B t-shirt off before I come back there and rip that B t-shirt off your body. Uh, okay, okay, Harold. I'll be sending you some B t-shirts and that's what you're gonna wear. Uh, okay. Okay, kiss my Beep. ass. Beep. Uh, hello? Harold? Harold? Well, I guess that's that then. And now to present to you the best postcard or small format war game is Kevin Bertram of Fort Circle Games. What do you think, Gracie? Hey, who's there? Hey, who's there? Oh, fuck. Who's there? Ah, oh, well. Hello, my name is Kevin Bertram, and I'm the owner of Fort Circle Games and the designer of the Shores of Tripoli. I'm very pleased to announce the Charles S. Roberts Award for Best Postcard Small Format Board War Game. They say good things come in small packages, and these small format games sure pack a punch. The nominees are A Hard Pounding Fight, The Battle for La Hassant, Five for Fighting, The Battles of D-Day, Emua, the Unification of Hawaii, 1795. JU-87 Stuka, Jericho Trumpets. SWAT, Hostage Rescue. And the winner is... Amua, The Unification of Hawaii, 1795. By David P. Rosado and published by LPS Inc. Congratulations, David. Hello, everybody. Hope you all are safe and sound. My name is... David Rosado. I'm the creator of the postcard game Imura. Uh, this is a great honor to win a Charles S. Roberts Award. 
Um, it's a very prestigious award and this is my uh, first game design. Um, I'd like to thank uh, a couple people. Uh, one, the publishers of the game Against the Odds magazine and in particular Captain Generals Tim and Steve and of course their team. Again, uh, thank you. I'm humbled and flattered to win this award and thank you. Hi, I'm Jack Green, uh, Quarter Deck International. Uh, been in the hobby for uh, <laughs> decades. <laughs> um, and today we're going to talk about the uh, Charles S. Roberts uh, nominees and winner for the best professional magazine in the uh, industry. But, but before, I want to preface my remarks with a couple of comments about the market itself. I mean. Many of us go back to the old uh, strategy and tactics days where you got a, a game in the magazine. And who would have thunk back in those days that strategy and tactics would actually run an ad in Playboy magazine? Uh, I don't know how much of a response they got. And uh, just to give you a little sense of the difference back in those days, uh, Avalon Hill had the general at the time. Uh, they ran their uh, ads in Boy's Life. So <laughs> quite quite a difference there. But that was part of uh, Jim Dunnigan's overall strategy was to try to put these ads out into a uh, myriad of different uh, uh, news sources, uh, opportunities to do advertising, to attract uh, uh, you know, more subscribers. And of course, that was the, the key. And, and you got to understand about a magazine, there's, there's, there's actually two things that are very important. One is cash flow. You have to continue to get your resubscriptions coming in and new subscribers for that matter so that you can maintain your cash flow so you can pay for the printing, you can pay for salaries if they exist. And they used to be, uh, uh, not, well, let's put it this way. You didn't go into a, a publish a war game magazine if you wanted to make a lot of money. I mean, that's just, you know, the, the Gary Gygax and Dungeons and Dragons is the uh, exception of, to the rule, so to speak. So the opportunity to get a magazine with a game in it every two months was um, a real magnet. And there's still a hardcore group of gamers who still subscribe to strategy and tactics. And there are two twin magazines that are out there, World War II and, and Modern War. So this, this business has, has stayed vibrant. And that, that brings up another point which is that the overall costs of printing and publishing on a unit basis has declined. You still need to have ideally 500 units or more if you're going to be publishing a game or if you're publishing a uh, magazine. But more importantly, you have to be able to sell those. So that brings up another aspect to uh, game publishing in a magazine form is that you're also uh, – have to deal with the time schedule. You got to have a product out every two months, or you're going to uh, potentially look uh, going to a bankruptcy court. Uh, in the case of Conflict Magazine, which I worked with with Dana Lombardi back in 1972, 1973, and yes, I did bankroll issue number five, the Calk and Gold issue, uh, and and Dana uh, also made good on that. I might add, it took us a while, but we got there. Uh, but uh, you can't have a bi-monthly magazine that comes out bi-annually. And that's what happened with the Conflict magazine back in the day. Uh, Aaliyah, which is a magazine out of, um, uh, actually, I'm not sure if it's Spain or Italy, but uh, from Europe for sure, uh, just reappeared on the radar uh, in the last two weeks after being absent for several years. Uh, and, and so the mag the, that's one reason I never got into um working a publishing a magazine is because that timetable that requirement to having a product whether uh, uh, ready to go it's uh, it's difficult and it's it's time consuming and the other thing is sometimes i know this will come as a shock to you folks out there but you might end up with some errata uh there's some Classic stories. I'm not going to name the game, and I'm not even going to name the publisher. But there was a publisher back in the '70s 
who published a rather large monster game, and it uh, it was in the in the states that uh, basically they were play testing it for the first time as they were printing the game and getting it uh, ready to go out the door. Uh, they did a reasonable job, and the errata wasn't too tremendous. Um, of course, another classic one is Flat Top, uh, which I worked on when I was with Battleline in 77, the summer of 77, that uh, we were rushing to make a deadline with that, which was to be at Origins, the old, old school Origins. And uh, that would have been uh, Origins 3. And as we were uh, trying to get four products at the time, Flat Top, um, uh, the Atlantic game, uh, there was, I believe, two others. I can't remember off the top of my head which they were. But the uh, Craig Taylor, the late Craig, the late great Mr. Taylor, um, he uh, had in the manuscript of the rules, which was a thick rule book, if you recall, 2,000 typos. And that was just to get it out. Now, bless Battleline Soul and, and Steve Peake and the gang. They got anybody who bought the game at Origins, got a new uh, corrected copy of the rules shortly thereafter. But it was all being driven by the timetable. So that kind of gives you a little bit of background there on uh, what the essence of doing this magazine publishing uh, entails. But let's also talk about the market for a second, because the, the, the market from when I had uh, Quarter Deck Games in the uh, early mid 80s to Quarter Deck International today, which, you know, we're talking several decades of, uh, of uh, evolution, if you like. I mean, yes, um, the hardcore, the hard old Grognard, uh, folks my age down into their uh, mid 50s, um, who've been in the hobby for decades, I mean, we're getting to be a smaller and smaller group. I mean, clearly we lost a, a ton of people to D and D and mag magic. Uh, we lost a even bigger ton of people to uh, computer gaming and computer war gaming, and also a whole new group coming up through there. But there have been several key aspects that I think that a lot of folks don't realize. In the old days, the European market, in which I would include the United Kingdom. The old, in the old days, you would sell 10, maybe 15% of your games, either as single orders or to distributors to Europe as a whole, okay? Now, we have a vibrant wargaming industry in Europe. I mean, we can start with uh, Italy. I can name four companies off the top of my head. There's at least two in Spain. There are game companies in France. We have a very prolific uh, publisher in Poland. And I recently purchased uh, some games uh, from Sweden on uh, conflicts during World War II in Finland. So, uh, and of course we have the British market. Um, today, that market probably represents somewhere between 30 and upwards to maybe 45% of, uh, of war game sales worldwide. Now, we look at Japan and we look at China. Uh, oh, before I leave the European market, there's another thing that I think, and I'm, I'm not sure of this. I believe it to be accurate, but I believe you'll find that the average age of the European war gamer is probably in their 40s going into their 50s. Now, there are obviously some old grognards like myself that are over there and been there since, you know, the 70s, really, uh, or before. Um, <clears throat> but that's that's a younger age group that is still vibrant and I think going to continue to do uh, some growing. And it's also propelled by the Euro phenomena, the, uh, which <laughs> the, the classic, of course, is Catan, four-player game, uh, German design, brilliant design, but uh, you know it's spilled over into other games, um, and and there there has been some crossbreeding in the block games, like what Columbia does, for example, or GMT does a fair number as well. Uh, I I believe uh, Compass has also done some block games um, that appeals to the Euro crowd. So that's another factor 
that uh, needs to be uh, put into this equation. Okay, so let's talk about the Japanese market for a second. Now, the Japanese market is probably a hardcore of around 2,000 gamers uh, who tend to be in their late 30s, uh, early 40s. Um, uh, there's a couple of fairly well-known game designers that uh, have come from uh, uh, Japan at this time. And of course, the old Command Magazine, which has been uh, defunct now for well over a decade, is still being uh, published and printed in Japan. Uh, using uh, games that they license from American uh, publishers. Uh, Revolution has done, uh, Revolution Games has had uh, a couple of games uh, picked up by them. And in turn, they also have their own domestic uh, designers of which I try to give attention to when I can. And that the fact that it's a younger crowd is also uh, beneficial in the long-term health of our hobby. And then the uh, final one I want to talk about is China, which has come on the scene. They basically, I don't know how China got involved in it. I know that part of it was because they were printing a fair number of games in China for American publishers. For example, my Bear Flag Republic, I had the uh, rule book, the map, uh, the game counters, uh, and the cards. Uh, done there where I had the rule book uh, done here, uh, uh, not the rule book, uh, the uh, charts, the combat results table cards uh, done here locally. Uh, the I have a very good relationship with War Drum Games and I'm very thankful for it, I might add. And uh, that's been very beneficial um, to Quarter Deck International and, and, and its future. So anyway, we're talking about maybe 2,000, maybe 3,000 hardcore war gamers in China, which out of a population of essentially a billion, uh, you know, it's, it's tiny. Um, but again, the, one of the key things here that has to be remembered is that they're primarily 20 and 30 year olds. Now, um, there's been a number of area movement games that came out of China of late, and but they seem to be going back to the Hex uh, games, uh, and, which which is definitely old school. Um, but anyway, that kind of brings you up a sense of what the overall market is and, and, and some of the aspects of, of publishing a, a game magazine. Uh, and, and I should add that these magazines don't have to but most of them do include a game in every issue. So I'm going to get now to the uh, nominees for the best professional war game uh, magazine. And uh, this will be in alphabetical order. And um, forgive me on my pronunciation of the French. Against the Odds. Published by Steve Rawling and edited by Andy Nunes is a five-time winner. And uh, it's a good magazine, uh, good games. Um, they've done a, a good job. I've got several in my keep uh, my keepers list, so to speak. I'm, by the way, I'm not a hardcore collector. I, I keep games that I enjoy, and I have moved many games out of the house that I didn't enjoy or uh, it just didn't make sense to keep. The second uh, nominee is Battles, published by Oliver Revenu, and is a three-time Best Professional War Game Magazine winner. And um, Battles is uh, one that has not been the um, most timely in publication, but they do a great deal of work. Again, I've got several copies of their magazine that I keep as keepers, so to speak. Then there is C3I by RBM Studios and edited by Roger McGowan. Uh, Steve McGowan and Mark Krasmikark. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that, Mark. Um, I mean, what can I say? I mean, Roger and team have been uh, stalwarts in the um, hobby and business for 
decades. And uh, I might just add a couple points about Roger here. He, along with uh, Dan Lombardi, really represented for years the uh, West Coast philosophy of graphics, which were warm colors, uh, stuff that popped, whereas the East Coast tended to be more black and white. Uh, if you look at some of the early um, graphics that uh, say s and put out or for that matter uh, Avalon Hill, you'll, you'll get a sense of, of what I mean. Um, <clears throat> the other thing about Roger, just as an aside, that's quite interesting is uh, he was the first one to sneak a credit on an Avalon Hill game box and that was uh, the Russian campaign. And uh, it was just coming out uh, when I was leaving Avalon Hill. And uh, the management at Avalon Hill was of the opinion that uh, an artist shouldn't necessarily have their name on a game. In fact, in early Avalon Hill days, you didn't even know who designed the game, let alone did the graphics. Well, Roger snuck his name <laughs> on the front cover of that. And bless his soul, that, uh, that went on to become quite common in the hobby. Uh, the next nominee is Modern War by Decision Games and edited by Kyle Lockwood and the design layout by Jason Stroyer. Um, Modern, World, uh, Modern War is one of the uh, three uh, horsemen, so to speak, of uh, Decision Games and uh, very good graphics. Uh, uh, again, a game in every issue uh, and uh, comprehensive uh, operation. And finally, the final uh, nominee is Strategy and Tactics, also by Des uh, Decision Games, and edited by Kyle Lockwood, and design layout by Jason Stroyer, and is a 12-time winner. I mean, when you think of a game in the magazine, if you were to pick one name and you were on Jeopardy, you would name uh, Strategy and Tactics. Uh, that's, that's just uh, uh, the nature of the beast. Now, and the winner is uh, C3I. On behalf of the entire team at C3I Magazine, RPM Studio, we're honored that you have chosen our magazine as the best war game magazine of 2019. We have always strived for quality in each and every issue since 1992, and we are excited to see C3I is appreciated and recognized by the gaming community worldwide. As Editor-in-Chief and Art Director, it's quite thrilling to be the first to read the articles submitted to me for each new issue. Our staff of all-star writers are very talented, and their work in the pages of C3I will be enjoyed and utilized by players for many years to come. We have to give special mention to C3I's Mark Herman, providing us with yet another thought-provoking installment of his CSR award-winning column, Cleo's Corner, not to mention his numerous other excellent articles in the magazine over the years. And of course, our second volume in our C3I Beginner Game Series, The Waterloo Campaign 1815. This is all thanks to Mark's genius. We strongly applaud him. The production of C3I 33 was especially difficult since it marked the passing of two industry giants and very close friends, Richard H. Berg and Chad Jensen. We dedicate C3I 33 and this CSR award to their memory. Thank you to all our fans around the world. Hello, I'm Tim Kask, and the organizers have asked me to uh, say a little something about how I've seen the game and the industry morph over the years and become what they are today. Um, not sure why they picked me, except perhaps longevity. Certainly isn't with my record of game magazines, um, four that are no longer uh, in existence. So 
where did where did it all begin? Well, for me, I've, I found board games when I was in sixth grade, like 1962, and、um, I thought that was gaming, and I was happy with that, and for many years. And then I found miniatures, and that was when I was in college, and a whole new thing. In the meantime. There are some guys in Minneapolis and some guys in Lake Geneva and some guys in Chicago that were doing other things. They were、uh, having campaigns of miniatures. They were、uh, working out、uh, this barony versus this barony versus that one, and、um, some of this ar- arose out of diplomacy. There was a lot of the game diplomacy involved in these early campaigns. Um, and、uh, they were just fighting out the, the battles when they couldn't、uh, work diplomacy when diplomacy failed. And、uh, they, this became a regular, a regular thing. Somewhere along the line, somewhere, somebody, Chicago, Lake Geneva, pro- probably Minneapolis, but not for sure, is these things were evolving, and guys were making up new games to play, and.、Um, New things to do. Somebody took a shine to a figure. We'll never know who that perfect, what that perfect moment was with him. But somebody decided that they they had a special fondness for a given figure. Probably a leader figure. Probably something they used in their mini battles to represent themselves, or a, a leading a, a treasured uh, unit uh, like your. Your mailed fist punch. In any way, he was special. So this guy must be special. So now he needs to be hit twice. And there we go. Well, that's a superhero. That becomes a nameless character. When Gary set out to write the rules for Dungeons and Dragons, he was aiming it at the miniatures crowd. The people like the people he played with, who did miniatures campaigns, who had units, who had armies, and who had leaders that did things. And the the original rules were, if you if you didn't know anything at all about miniatures, the original rules were horrible. I told him that. That's how I got hired, <laughs> and、uh, started making them more legible, but. the the market was not there. We didn't even call it role playing in the beginning. I don't remember what we called it. We didn't call it anything until one day some one of us came up with it must be role play. I I do know that when we started getting some attention from the media, a couple of three of us.、Uh, I know Gary and I both, and I, maybe one or one of the other guys. When when asked by writers, what's it like? We would say it was like being in a play, t- playing a role, assuming this character, and I think eventually we just kept calling it role playing. I believe that's how it came about. That just a, a thing of convenience. And anyway,、uh, that's that's how that happened. While this was going on, other the other gaming individuals、uh, and creative people were coming out with stuff, and.、Uh, Gary's and I had a mutual vision, and that was fulfilled in Dragon Magazine. And we provided a vehicle that lifted all boats, because the rising tide lifts all boats. We churned the tide. Didn't say that quite right, did I? We churned the tide and made it happen. And、uh, th- we didn't care as long as it was a good game. I wrote about it, or I had someone I published about it. Um, we encouraged the other companies. We guarded our copyrights, granted, but we were rather generous in, in giving permissions for、uh, fanzines and things like that. We were rather generous because we wanted to see not only our game, not only role playing, because now other people were jumping on the wagon and coming out with their versions, but we wanted to see the hobby grow. And now look where it's grown to.、Um, I know、uh, Gary was quite pleased with where it had gone, 
at the time that uh, he died, and it's gone even farther since. So I know he'd be pleased. Uh, I know I'm the, I'm the the last of the original TSR people that kind of kick started, <laughs> and there's a there's a word that has a new meaning now. We kind of kick started this whole uh, thing, and I'm real pleased to have done that, and uh, I'm pleased uh, with the social effects that we initiated and um, made possible through role playing and. Uh, I'm, if imitation is the best form of flattery, yeah, we, we must have done pretty good because everybody and their brother has jumped into it. You can't play a video game without uh, acknowledging some part of role play in its mechanics. So um, where has it gone? Well, it went from me playing with a guy in sixth grade for two years because I didn't know any other gamers, and then not playing with anybody in high school and then playing with one guy for a year in the military, and then playing with eight guys in junior college, no, actually four guys in junior college, eight when I got to the university, to now I know hundreds. Uh, the, the, the hobby is enormous. The conventions are huge. I quit going to Gen Con because it's so big and uh, impersonal on that, but I still continue to go to the small cons. You should too if you're able to, otherwise play virtually. Um, I'm real tickled <laughs> uh, with uh, where we've gone. I'm real tickled that there's still a uh, market for creative people, and I think that uh, Kickstarter is probably the best thing that ever hit gaming, because if you have a good enough game, and you successfully kickstart it and you fulfill your kickstarter on time and the game's good you'll do well and if you don't do any of those things in between you won't but i think you know in some regards it's uh, a really uh, a almost golden age of gaming we have all the internet gaming we check branches not as much as much fun as face to face and we're, 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 we're restricted on our face-to-face. -face. But isn't it the sharing, the wetty banter, the needling uh, that goes around, that still happens virtually. Some games you can see each other's face when you deliver that stinger. We miss the, the camaraderie, the fellowship around the table. And that's a, it's, a, it's a good thing that gaming produces. It's real sad to miss. But we'll get through this. Be smart. Take care of yourself. Take precautions. I'm known for this. Wear a mask. Continue the game. And I hope to see some of you at a convention sometime in 21. Candace Harris, and I'm here to present the best science fiction or fantasy war game category for the 2019 Charles S. Roberts Awards. Some of the previous winners for this category were War of the Ring Collector's Edition in 2010, Space Empires 4X in 2011, and Star Wars X-Wing Miniatures Game in 2012. The nominees for 2019 are Dune, designed by Bill Eberly, Jack Kitteridge, and Peter Alotka, based on Frank Herbert's classic sci-fi novel Dune, and is a re-implementation of the original Dune board game from 1979. In Dune, two to six players are leaders of one of six asymmetrical factions, vying for control over the most valuable resource in the universe, the mysterious spice Melange, which is only found at great cost on the planet Dune. Escape from Hades, designed by Fred Manzo and developed by Herman Lutman. Escape from Hades is a solitaire science fiction game 
played on two wraparound hex maps representing the exterior and interior of a cylindrical prison. It's a race against time as you make an opposed landing on the prison's surface, destroy its defenses, shimmy in through the maintenance shafts, fight your way to the princess, then fight your way back out again, all while your ship fights for its mechanical life against squadrons of enemy fighters and surface defenses. Red Alert Space Fleet Warfare, designed by Richard Borg, who's famous for designing the Commands and Color system and his games, Battle Cry, Commands and Colors Ancients, and Memoir 44, to name a few. Red Alert Space Fleet Warfare is a Commands and Colors game in space and allows two to six players to duke it out in space. The play of commands cards drives the action and creates a fog of war while battle dice resolve combat quickly and efficiently. Combat cards add an element of suspense and challenge players to maintain their star token reserves to power their combat cards through the course of battle. The action on a combat card may hinder the opposition forces, enhance a player's units, or may instantly change the course of battle. Space Infantry Resurgence, designed by Gattardo Zancani and Blackwell Hurd. In Space Infantry Resurgence, one to two players command an elite squad of veteran Space Infantry soldiers, taking on the daunting task of fighting against unknown alien foes through challenging environments using only the weapons and tools on hand, or whatever can be scrounged along the way to achieve victory. And finally, Time of Legends Joan of Arc, designed by Pascal Bernard. Time of Legends Joan of Arc is a story-driven game for two to four players with miniatures set amid the tumult of the Hundred Years' War. Players take on the roles of various factions in the war, including the famous heroes and heroines such as the Black Prince, the Dauphin, Falstaff, and of course, Joan of Arc herself in addition to some supernatural creatures that have emerged from the shadows. Each game is a unique scenario with its own map assembled from the gaming tiles and a specified set of heroes and followers to achieve the scenario's objectives. Each scenario has its own victory conditions, often different for each side, but the game also includes a battle mode to fight out conflicts between armies of your choosing. And the winner for Best Science Fiction or Fantasy War Game category for the 2019 Charles S. Roberts Awards is... Dune! Congratulations! Hi. I'm Peter Olakia. Here's a recap of our 1979 Doom project. Avalon Hill calls, asking us if we can design Doom ASAP. There are some tricky Doom IP issues to navigate, culminating with a collect call from Frank Herbert himself. The impact of a Doom blockbuster movie looms over the game. Alas, the movie bombs and our Doom game goes out of print despite its many game design awards. Forty years passed by, four decades. Okay, here's a recap of our 2019 Doom project. Gale Force 9 calls, asking us to redesign Doom. Design schedule is ASAP. There are tricky IP issues to navigate involving La La La. The impact of a Doom blockbuster movie is imminent. Hi. I'm Peter Alakia, and this is starting to feel like Groundhog Day with Shai Halu. Hi, my name is Jack Kittredge. I came up with the simultaneous dial-based resolution system for a game that we never published called Tribute, which was uh, about ancient Rome. Um, but we found that the, they, they made perfect battle wheels for Dune, so that's how we used that idea. Hi. I'm Bill Eberly. I was 33 when Jack, Peter, and I created the Dune board game. Now we're in our 70s and proud to receive this historic Charles S. Roberts Award. Thank you. 
Special thank you to our fans who kept Dune alive when it was no longer being published. Thanks also to Gale Force 9 and Battlefront Miniatures. It's great to have Dune back in the marketplace again. Gentle people, not only is our next presenter totally immersed in cooperative and solo games, but he also has a podcast called Board Game Buffet. Please, Dean Leggett. The nominees for the Charles S. Roberts Award for Best Solitaire or Cooperative Board Game are Fields of Fire 2, designer Ben Hall, publisher GMT Games. Jeff Davis, The Confederacy at War, designer Ben Madison, publisher White Dog Games. Peloponnesian War, designer Mark Herman, publisher GMT Games. U-Boat, The Board Game. Designers, Bartosz Pluta and Artur Salvarovsky, publisher, Phalanx. And finally, Zeppelin Raider, Imperial German Naval Airships, designer, Gregory M. Smith, publisher, Coppice Games. And the winner of the Charles S. Roberts Award for Best Solitaire Cooperative Board Game is U-Boat, the board game. Designers, Bartosz Pluta, Artur Salvarovsky, publisher, Phalanx Games. Congratulations to all the nominees and the winner. Hello, this is Artur Salvarovsky from Iron Wolf Studio again. Uh, in this video, I would like to express our thanks for the Best Solitaire or Cooperative Board Wargame Award. Uh, so, as you may imagine, U-Boat was intended as a co-op from the very start. And uh, uh, as it is with uh, most cooperative board games, the alpha player problem will inevitably emerge when one, where one player uh, wants to uh, do it all and uh, actually ruins the experience for everybody else. So uh, we wanted to tackle both things at the same time because uh, if we had a game with a captain who wouldn't be in command, that wouldn't uh, actually work for for me and I guess it wouldn't work for many uh, players, right? Being the captain and not being able to command. So uh, we wanted to uh, to have a chain of command in the game that would allow the captain to stay in command but at the same time allow the other players to have their own choices and ways of doing things on the tactical and operational level. And uh, the, the way the roles interact was designed uh, to foster the exchange of information, to actually make players exchange information um, all the time. And also working under pressure, because uh, in a real-time game, when challenges uh, amass and uh, it becomes necessary to um, deal with problems quickly, but you have to deal with them together, uh, each single player cannot uh, solve the problems alone. Uh, I guess this really um, made U-Boat uh, what it is and uh, actually uh, Das Boot was one of the main inspirations, well, no wonder, and the way the characters in the movie interact, it also helped us um, to establish this sort of interplay between the characters and uh, make um, gameplay uh, appeal to, to, to people who are Mm, who like co-ops and, and uh, military games as well, uh, with a strong uh, theme. Uh, so, you can play the game as a solitaire, and although there is a lot happening, uh, then again, a lot of players do enjoy this setup, and I personally think that, um, on the one hand, it, uh, the game loses some of its appeal that comes from the communication uh, with other players, but on the other hand, you are in full control, and I guess that some players uh, will prefer it this way, and we have heard from a lot of uh, people who enjoy the game in this setup, although, yes, I have to agree, uh, there is a lot to wrap your head around. All in all, I would like to thank uh, everybody for their votes, and I am glad that the way we approach the co-op aspect of the game uh, has proved to be um, the right direction. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your votes. We take the award as a recognition for our efforts to publish highest quality war games. Many of them of less popular subject than submarine warfare. We wouldn't be here if not the friendship and help of many individuals. 
Kevin Zucker, Uli Blanneman, Martin Wallace, Charles Vasey, Adam Sterkweather, Tony Curtis, Ed Beach, and Jason Matthews. And our partners, Ada Synchron, Maskeoka, Pegasus, and all across the world. There is also my private, very sincere thanks to my friend and mentor, Mark Simonich. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, everyone. Hopefully, see you next year. Fritz Braun. You know what I'm saying? The guy's almost as talented as I am. Oh, man. The guy, he's, he's, he's a film producer. He's an actor. He's a, he's a, 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 a video game mogul. Uh, he's, he's even... He's good-looking, too, I, I think. And, uh, you know, what can I say? I can never get used to drinking with these helmets on. Ladies and gentlemen, Fritz Brauner. Thank you for the kind introduction. And it is an absolute privilege and honor to be presenting these awards. And this is going to be covering the Technical Achievement Awards. And I've had the honor of playing many strategy war games through my life. And it goes back all the way to games like Midway and Africa Corps and it's just the evolution of gaming and the mechanics and the materials and the printing quality with the technology that's been developed along the ages has improved so much. So I have the privilege of presenting the Technical Achievement Awards and the first award I'll be doing shortly. The first award will be Best Board War Game Playing Components. And this has been an amazing evolution as far as gaming goes, and all of these nominees have bright, brilliant, beautiful printing as far as relief against the backdrop, color coordination, and just beautiful pieces and components. The first nominee is Crossing the Line, Aachen, 1944. Gorgeous, crisp colors on that as far as the components go. The next nominee is Nevesky, Teutons, and Russ in Collision, 1240 to 1242. Beautiful relief as far as the components and the map pieces and the illustrations as far as that and the easy to read as far as the uh, lettering and everything on the components. The next nominee, U-Boat, the board game. Gorgeous components as well, it has a large submarine, small little pl uh, resin pieces as far as showing the various parts of the crew and everything, fantastic coloring and everything else. The next nominee, Wings of the Motherland, another gorgeous looking game with components that stand out. World at War 85, Storming the Gap. Nice crisp lettering to read the components as far as that goes against a very beautiful map relief as well. May I have the envelope please? The winner of the best board game playing components goes to U-Boat the Board Game, Bartos Plutoka, Bartos Pluta, Arta Sawaski, and Phalanx Game 5. Congratulations, Best War Game Components. Hello, this is Arta Sawaski again, uh, broadcasting from Iron Wolf Studio HQ. Uh, wow, I guess that people really liked the way the components for U-Boats turned out because we actually won four different awards and which are um, Best Map Graphics, Best Playing Components, Best Wargame Rules and the Best Box Cover Art. Well, that is actually uh, a lot, so I will try to address each of those you know, one by one. So as Regards best map graphics, I was actually quite surprised because we didn't do much um, with the source material that uh, that we had. Because the the map in our games, actually the Marine Quadrat Karte, the grid system that the Kriegsmarine used during the Second World War. So we didn't actually do much about how it works, but I can understand that it appeals to war gamers because it looks like the real thing. So, yeah, I guess, um, I'm not sure if we deserve it, but it, it does the job. Yeah. Okay, then we've got the best playing components uh, as well. Uh, well, this, this uh, hmm, entails a few different 
things that I would like to talk about. Uh, first, the 3D submarine, which is obviously the centerpiece uh, as far as the haptic components go. So, uh, the funny thing about the 3D submarine is that at the beginning of the project, uh, we wanted to have it. Uh, so, it was uh, day one almost thing to have 3D components and the, the uh, sub uh, as, a, as a 3D object. But, as you may imagine, it was not an easy thing to, to do. And as we started researching it, we came to this conclusion quite early that uh, we actually wouldn't be doing it. So, at some point, we had a traditional flat board um, and uh, it was the publisher, it was Phalanx actually, who pushed for the 3D sub and, uh, yeah, they uh, they actually did a lot about it and um, uh, in the end, I guess, while it isn't perfect, some people have found some imperfection and some imper imperfections and, um, well, as you might imagine, yeah, cutting cardboard uh, to this sort of um, level of precision is a difficult thing, even with today's technology. Well, all things considered, I guess, in the end, it's, it does the job. It enhances the immersion and I think um, it was a good idea after all. Uh, then we have the figures, guns and other 3D components. Uh, so I believe while they are not uh, the standard of some miniature battle games, then again, uh, well, the, the scale is actually quite small. It's 1 to 72 if I uh, remember right. But, well, it was a difficulty for the, uh, on the material aspect of things, because the sculpts were in, in fact very detailed and it was kind of difficult to, um, to cast them using uh, the kind of material that would both uh, hold so that they would break too easily, but well, we had to take, uh, we had to um, uh, reach a compromise of some kind. But I guess all in all, we we're, we're quite happy with how they all turned out. Then I'd like to uh, say just a few words about my my favorite component of all, which is obviously the attack disc. Uh, so this is again one of the things that nobody liked. Uh, at the very beginning. So when we decided to have the navigator in the game, well, actually, I actually wanted this role to have some navigation to do, not just call this this player the navigator and then, uh, I don't know, have them do all sorts of stuff other than navigation. So to me, it wouldn't make sense. So um, being a sailor myself, uh, I know a thing or two about navigation. I'm not an expert, but I did my homework and um, it appeared very quickly that this uh, could be a very interesting part of the game. So I pushed for it. There were very many iterations of this system, but the, actually the closer I got to the original idea of this um, torpedo attack disc, the, the better it turned out. So in the end, uh, I had to convince uh, well, Bartosz actually agreed with me quite early. He, he saw the potential and he agreed that it's not actually something terribly difficult. Uh, and uh, uh, in the end, there are so many people who say it's the best part of the game. So I'm actually quite happy with how it turned out. Then we've got um, the Board Game Rules Award. So, best board game rules. This is actually kind of funny, again, because, well, I wrote the rules. Mm, it was my first rule book ever. Well, I actually worked on some, some uh, war game rules uh, before that, but this is my first published game, and I guess I'm very happy and proud that it turned out the way it did. Uh, what can I say? It was a difficult thing to write rules for a game that is quite hard to compare, uh, that does not have a direct equivalent, so there weren't actually so many places to, to draw from, but all in all, I think that the rules are, are decent, and um, although there, there have been some, some problems on the way, but notwithstanding, um, I guess 
they, they hold their own and they, they make sense, at least to some degree. So, so I guess um, thank you very much for the award. Then we've got the best box cover art. And uh, this is actually, again, something that our, our publisher uh, got hold of. Uh, it was actually uh, Michał Ozon from Phalanx who found it, I think. And yeah, I believe it conveys the theme very well. It is dark, somber, um, not too colorful. I, I really like the way it's the mood. Uh, at some point we were worried that it would be too dark and nobody would notice it in a board game store. But I guess this kind of game is not an impulse buy and it is more for hardcore fans of the, of the theme. So actually not being called colorful and eye-catching was not such a problem after all. And we are very happy that um, most people liked it in the end. So again, I would like to express our thanks for, for the award and uh, we're really happy that so many people liked our game and voted for it. Thank you. Our next category, Best War Game Map Graphics. It's amazing how the crisp look of all these nominees in this category, as far as their maps go, are just fantastic. The nominees are Death Valley Battles for the Shenandoah. Beautiful relief, overlook view like a plane flying over, seeing the trees, the forest, and the valley as far as the counters to stand out. The next nominee, Nevesky, Teutons and Russ in Collision, 1240 to 1242. Another beautiful rendering as a map goes with interesting color palettes and such. The next nominee, Stalingrad, 42. Beautiful pop out colors. The Black Sea and the water as far as the river streams really pop out crisp so you know where the critical crossings are. The next nominee, The Last Hundred Yards by GMT Kames. Another beautiful printed colors popping out to read. And the last nominee, U-Boat the Board Game. The envelope, please. The winner of the best war game map graphics goes to U-Boat the Board Game. Bartosz Pluta, Otto Sarawaski, Phalanx Games 5. Congratulations. Welcome back. Our next category, Best Board Game War Game Rules. This is where we have complex battles and we need to be able to simplify and bring across how to play the game, and this is in a fantastic awards category to have. The clarity to understand how to play these games. And all of them have fantastic rules. The nominees are the Peloponnesian Wars, Stalingrad 42, U-Boat the Board Game, Undaunted Normandy, Wings Over the Motherland, and the envelope, And the award goes to U-Boat the Board Game. Bartos Pluta, Arto Sarawaski, Phalanx Game 5. Congratulations again. Our next category, Best Computer Assist Module. And this is an exciting period in gaming and especially war gaming because we have all this technology from 3D printing to apps and as far as having feed in with your phone and having data crunching and everything else. So we have only one nominee in this category for this year. And the nominee is U-Boat the Board Game. Thank you. Anticipation here. <laughs> the winner is U-Boat the Board Game. Congratulations. Our last category, Best Original Box Cover Art. Now this is a multi-fold strategy as far as what a box cover art is. 
First of all, it has to be appealing. But in this world of war gaming, it has to be accurate as well. And all of these pre present beautiful, dramatic images as far as the period and as far as the action and the essence of what these games are about. The nominees are Nevesky Tutoms and Rus in Collision, 1240 to 1242. The Peloponnesian Wars, Stalingrad 42. U-Boat, the board game. And the last nominee, Wings of the Motherland. And the envelope, please. And the award goes to U-Boat, the board game. Bartos Bluta, Bartos Sarawaski, Failings Game 5. Congratulations. Thank you very much, and it's been a privilege to present these awards. I got introduced to this next presenter through the fantastic interviews of Harold Buchanan. He has a podcast which is called Harold on Games. I strongly suggest you check it out. Some really good insights in there. Ladies and gentlemen, Trevor Bender. As game players, we enjoy having additional value added to the games that we enjoy so much. This is often frequently done through conversation with friends about theoretical options in a game, or reading on Board Game Geek articles that have been posted there, or more frequently looking into magazines like C3I or Special Ops, which publish variants or variant counters or scenarios that we can use to add additional value to our games. Perhaps the best way to do this, though, is by looking at expansions that have been published by the original manufacturer. And so that is what leads us up to our Charles S. Roberts Award category today. My name is Trevor Bender, and I've been asked to introduce this category, which is the best expansion or supplement for an existing board war game. Some of you may know me by my Twitter handle, which is GameChanger2. I've got a, quite a number of variants and articles and scenarios um, that I've prepared and published in C3i Magazine and other locations to do just that, give, expand, give additional value to existing games. Perhaps the, the one you may have heard the most is my two expansions to GMT's Labyrinth series, Labyrinth Awakening and Labyrinth Forever War. All right, we have five particular nominations in this category of best expansion or supplement for an existing board war game. The first of these is Great War Commander British Expeditionary Force. This comes from Hexim's, Hexasim's publications. Many of you will remember uh, the, the Combat Commander series published by GMT uh, many years ago, which is quite famous as the World War II uh, tactical war game. Great War Commander does the same thing, but for the World War I fronts. Next up after that is another a GMT product, Next War Supplement Number 2, Insurgency. This allows for an expansion of the insurgency topic to uh, existing popular titles such as Next War Korea, Next War Taiwan. Uh, Next War India, etc. The fantastic series. Now we have another publication from Multi Man Publications, Red Factories. This is a reprint and also an expansion of that reprint of the Red Barricades, the very first advanced squad leader historical module that came out in 1995. Charlie Kilder did a fantastic job on that. It's been redone and expanded with new scenarios. Another GMT product follows after that. Time of Crisis, Age of Iron and Rust. Time of Crisis is the game that's on the Roman Empire era as players compete for influence across the Mediterranean Basin. Finally, we have an air expansion to Wing Leader, Eagles 1943 to 1945. This adds in aircraft from the second half of World War II. And now it's time to announce the winner for our category series of best expansion or supplement. Drum roll, please. The winner is Time of Crisis, Age of Iron and Rust by GMT. Congratulations to designers Ray Farrell and Brad Johnson. Well done on this expansion. I hope that this serves as an opportunity to everyone, to both designers and players of games, to think about an expansion you might consider for a game that you like a lot. Anybody can do these expansions. It doesn't have to be the original design team. Just come up with a great idea, perhaps write an article for a magazine or post an idea on Board Game Geek or other social media and see where it goes from there. 
get some play testers together, put something together. Who knows, maybe you could be nominated next. Ray and I are extremely flattered that Time of Crisis, The Age of Iron and Rust has been selected to receive the Charles S. Roberts Award for Best Expansion for an existing board war game in 2019. We would like to sincerely thank the CSR committee and the voters for this very generous recognition. Just to be included among the other fantastic nominees is a great honor. We'd like to thank GMT Games and Andy Lewis in particular for believing in and publishing Time of Crisis. Thank you to Roger McGowan, Mark Simonich, Kurt Miller, and Charles Kibler for art and graphics. Many thanks to producers Tony Curtis, Roger McGowan, Andy Lewis, Gene Billingsley, and Mark Simonich. A shout out to our friends and playtesters at the Gamers Armory in North Carolina and the Ludophilia Group in Illinois, among others. And we must thank Ray's wife Lou and my wife Pam for loving support of our hobby. Ray and I will both definitely continue with our efforts in game design, thanks in large part to all of these people I've mentioned. We have hopes that a second expansion for Time of Crisis could be possible in the future. Thank you again. What's No Enemies Here? It's a box and a lid. Born in a <laughs> really? These sons of bitches? But I think that's a great thing to be nuts. And drink scotch. Are you wearing that stupid beef in Michigan t-shirt? <laughs> All right, well, here we go. Here. Hey guys, it's Herman Lutman. You never really know what it's going to be. You know why? Because I don't. And now Tim Toe presents us with a modern, hypothetical, post-World War II category. Take it away, Tim. The Cold War and hypothetical era category spans the period after World War II to the near future. It covers events that have happened and those that might have been. This year's nominees are Blue Water Navy, designed by Stuart Tong and published by Compass Games. It is an Air Navy submarine game of World War III in the 1980s. The map spans from Cuba and Florida in the west through the Mediterranean Sea to the Kola Peninsula in the east. Units are air squadrons, ship groups, and submarines. Three time periods covered by the game are 1983, 1985, and 1989. Hearts and Minds, Vietnam, 1965 to 1975, by John Ponisk and Compass Games. This is the third edition of this card-driven, quick-playing area movement game. It contains 80 cards, tokens to represent opposing forces. Veteran troops are a necessity in this game, and untried troops are a liability. This game shows John's experience in designing counterinsurgency simulations. The next nominee is Less Than 60 Miles, which covers the famous Fulda Gap in West Germany. It is an operational simulation with units at the regiment and battalion level. It focuses on the three C's, command, communications, and control. Designed by Fabrizio Vianello and Marco Semino, and published by Thin Red Line Games. This is the first in a series of the C3 series of games, which will cover the entire NATO Warsaw Pact conflict in Central Europe. Set in 1985, it contains two campaign games and three smaller scenarios. Red Storm, Air War Over Central Germany, 1987. Designed by Douglas Bush and published by GMT Games. This is the second sequel to the Charles S. Roberts award-winning game Downtown by Lee Brickham Wood. It utilizes the downtown game system to simulate a hypothetical air war in May, June of 1987 over the central portion of the NATO Warsaw packed front in central Germany. Like other games in the series, air units in Red Storm are flights of one to four aircraft, each tasked with different roles such as bombing, combat air patrol, close escort, or jamming support. Red Storm features more than 50 types of aircraft, including both older third generation workhorses like the F-4 Phantom II and MiG-23 Flogger, as well as advanced fourth generation fighters including the F-15 Eagle and the Soviet MiG-29 Fulcrum. World at War, Storming the Gap, is a platoon-level chit-pull interactive game system 
that covers scenarios at the tactical level for World War III, fought in 1985. The rules cover variable turn links, random formation activation, point blank and long range weapons fire, line of sight, and many more things. It is a modern successor to the Avalon Hill classics of Panzer Leader and Panzer Blitz and Arab Israeli Wars. And the winner of this year's 2019 Cold War and Hypothetical Era board war game is Storming the Gap, World at War 85. I'd like to thank Tim Toe and his team for reinvigorating the Charles S. Roberts Awards. Every designer, artist, and publisher appreciates recognition among their peers. Truly a wonderful thing to have them back. Thank you all so much for the honor and privilege of this award. I'm overwhelmed and grateful and, well, overwhelmed and grateful. Next, I want to thank all 1,400 plus of you who backed the Kickstarter of Storming the Gap and all those gamers who were kind enough to nominate Storming the Gap for this award. My greatest thrill is that you all appear to be having as much fun playing it as I and my team did, which was our goal. I want to thank the inestimable David Heath, head of Lock and Load Publishing, who initiated the World at War 85 series and gave me the wonderful opportunity to bring Storming the Gap to life. Many thanks to his team, including Blackwell Hurd, Mark Von Marshall, Darren White, Patrick White, Nate Rogers, Maurice Fitzgerald, Devin Heinley, Trent Garner, Hans Cording, Brad Smith, Noah Stoltz, Shane Heath, and Al Davis. A huge thank you to lead designers of some other Lock and Load projects, Ralph Ferrari, Sean Drollinger, and Steve Overton, for patiently lending me their ears and offering just good advice during this process. On my design and development team side, a huge thank you to my lead playtester, co-developer, Monster Map Scenario Master, and sounding board Jeff Schulte. He's the heart of the cards. The formation cards in this case. Thank you as always, Jeff. I'd also like to thank my development leads, Matt Lose and Phil Bolger, and our incredible development team. Mark Archambault, Nuno Castillo, Tony Costa, Thomas O'Neill, Dwayne Parsons, Felix de Rousse, Nicholas Michon, Dean Morrissey, Ian Tracton, Warren Tutwiler, Arrigo Villaconia, Mike Wheel, Phil Wolreb, and Paul Summers Young. I'm going to talk about the Hall of Fame. The Hall of Fame for board game designers is the Clausewitz, the most prestigious of the Charles S. Roberts Awards. It's given annually to one person for continued contributions to the field of board war game. I had the honor to be inducted into the Hall of Fame many years ago, and I'm still very proud of it. It meant a lot to me. So thank you all again for that. This year's honoree is known to us all. In fact, if I had asked any one of you, you probably would have assumed that he had already been in the Hall of Fame for years. But somehow, no. And as of now, that is rectified. Our honoree is a skilled and prolific game designer, but he is so much more. He's also a master of the layout and graphic skills that make our complex games playable. He was a founder of one of the classic companies at the dawn of our hobby, and he spent many years serving you as an officer of Gamma, the Game Manufacturers Association. By every measure, he deserves our thanks, and he deserves this honor. Our winner this year is Rich Banner. And here's where, in a live session, I'd stop for long applause. Accepting for Rich is his friend and fellow Hall of Fame member, Mark Miller. I'm honored to talk to you tonight about my friend Rich Banner, because I can say some things that will be hard for him to say about himself. This award is for those who have left their mark on our hobby of military games, war games. He designed the Holy Grail of war games, a division level game of the Russian front 
of World War II. It was his vision that then created the Europa series, all of the campaigns of European World War II, North Africa, France, England, in compatible formats, actually playable together. If that were his only accomplishment, it would be more than enough. But he did so much more. He created System 7 Napoleonics, innovative printed counters for truly awesome Napoleonics battles. He was an award-winning art director. He created the iconic little black book look for Traveler. He helped organize the industry's Game Manufacturers Association, and he was its first treasurer. From there, he advanced to its presidency, where he served admirably during its formative years. Any one of his accomplishments would be enough to say he left his mark on our hobby. But he did it time and again. Rich is one of their game designers in the legendary Game Designers Workshop and truly deserves to be recognized with this award. Hello, everybody. My name is Mark Herman. I'm sitting here in the uh, outside uh, near my house, and um, it is my distinct honor to be the presenter for the James F. Dunnigan Award for Elegance and Playability. Um, I, I'm familiar with this award. Uh, I won it back in 1998 for the people. Uh, it, it, is a, uh, it was a great honor then, and it's going to be a great honor for me to pass this along. And, and what I would say about the award is it both, in some ways, it recognizes like the game, uh, a particular game, but usually it's meant to, to um, recognize a game system. It, it's more because, uh, you know, it, it, you could win the uh, game of the year uh, in a category, but when you win the Dunnigan Award, you're really winning it for a system that has shows elegance, it, that it really is provocative, it's thematic and all of the above. And without further ado, a gentleman who I know quite well, uh, I have collaborated with him for many years, and the winner this year of the James F. Dunnigan Award is my good friend, Volko Runke. So congratulations, uh, Volko, for a well-deserved award. Uh, you won it for Nevsky. Uh, and it's a, a, I've, played with, I've actually played it with uh, Volko, and it's a fabulous system, and it's well-deserving of this award. So again, congratulations to Volko and to his entire team who helped him uh, put this one onto the market. So congratulations and adieu. This is Volko Runka. I'm designer of Nevsky Two Tons and Roos in Collision 1240 to 1242. And I want to say I was so happy to see the Charles S. Robert Awards uh, kick in again and that there would be a, a contest uh, running this year. I had missed uh, following the, the contest in, in past years, and so that was for me uh, a wonderful affirmation of the continued dedication to our hobby. And uh, now that uh, I am honored to receive the James Dunnigan Design Elegance Award, I'm only that much more excited to see the Charlies back in action. Uh, this award for Design Elegance, um, spurred by my work on Nevsky, um, affirms some other truths for me about our hobby. One is that we have many, many uh, nearly limitless stories left to tell from history involving military affairs and many other aspects of, of human affairs, interwoven politics, uh, economics, and so forth, that we can emphasize lo logistics or command relationships or combined arms uh, in any number of combinations. And if it is executed in a uh, plausible model in an engaging game, if it has what we might think of as elegance in design and delivering all that in a package that is uh, more enjoyable uh, than burdensome, then board war gamers will, will engage in it, will explore it, and will embrace it. And that uh, truth, as embodied in, I think, this uh, award for Nevsky, um, is a, a very happy portent for the future of our hobby. We have many, many new adventures to explore. I designed Nevsky originally principally for myself and I thought it might appeal to um, those with a special interest in something obscure like uh, medieval warfare at the operational level uh, in 
some corner of the medieval world. And the fact that not only uh, war gamers and, um, and critics, but also board gamers generally um, have uh, chosen to try it out and, and play it and are enjoying it much more than I could have hoped um, also gives me uh, great optimism that the boundaries of our interest in traveling through military history on the tabletop, um, uh, well, we haven't yet reached those boundaries among players. Thank you so much for the support for Nevsky. Uh, thank you so much, um, volunteers running the Charles S. Roberts Awards for uh, re, uh, vivifying the Charlies. Thank you all for your support and for this award. It's a great uh, and exciting honor for me. Uh, Bukowski's always a good reader. Huh? Well, I, I have the last say here and we waited obviously for the big prize, which is War Board Game of the Year. Before that, I'd like to say that I'm really, really honored uh, with this opportunity to showcase the games and produce, produce the awards, that is. I'd like to thank Tim Toll and uh, Roger B. McGowan for, for being trusting enough to let me handle a project like this. So without further ado, Let's get right with it. So the nominees, and I should say, the first nominee for best board war game of the year is Nevsky. Russ, Teutons, and Russ in Collision, 1240 to 1242. This is a game designed by Volker Runke. The artists are Roger B. McGowan, Checho Nieto, Checho Nieto, I'm sorry, and Mark Sinich. And it's published by GMT. I would just like to make a suggestion here, uh, Volko. You know, uh, uh, Teutons and Russ. I mean, yeah, you could say it's obscure. I guess a little less obscure now because we know the game. But I mean, you know, if you want to sell more games like Teutons and Russ, it doesn't flow off the tongue too easily. You should have called it Toots and Russ, like Puss and Boots. But anyways. Our next nominee is Stalingrad 42. This is a game designed, and the artist is Mark Simonich. Designed by Mark Simonich, he is also the artist. Uh, uh, Mark, uh, and it's published by GMT, I'm sorry. Mark, can I, can I give you a piece of advice here? Stalingrad 42. 42 when? 1642? 1342? You know, Volko was even more precise, 1240 to 1242. I understand, but Stalingrad 42? You know, you could sell more games by, you know, being a bit more precise. But anyways, I digress. Our next nominee is u -Book, the board game, designed by Batos Pluta and Arthur Salvarovsky. The artist is Chris Clore, and it's published by Phalanx Games. I can't say, I can't really give you guys much advice here. You've been nominated in every single category yet. You must be doing something right. The next one is very, very dear to me. It's Undaunted Normandy. The designers are David Thompson and Trevor Benjamin and published by Osprey Games. You know, I, 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 I want to get my copy here, but my, my, oh yeah, Dave, my copy. I never got it. Anyways, and our last nominee is Winds of the Motherland, designed by J.D. Webster. The artist is Ian Wedge and published by Clash of Arm Games. Now, J.D. Webster, I'm just curious, do people come and ask you what does this word mean and what does that word mean? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Okay, and the award goes to U-Boot, the board game, a game designed by, and I just lost the page, by Baktos Puta and Arthur Salvarovsky. The artist is Chris Clore, published by Phalanx Games. Congratulations for winning the best board game, war board game of the year. 
Hello, this is Bartosz Pluta and Artur Szabrowski from Ironwood Studio. First of all, we would like to thank the voters for awarding the prize to our game in so many different categories. We would also like to thank everybody who helped this game come to completion. Without you, we would have never been able to succeed. When we started this project, we agreed that we had to come up with something new and exciting. Something that would really set our game apart from all the others. Something out of the ordinary that would let the players feel as if they were not just playing a game, but actually felt as if they were living and fighting on a German U-boat. After many considerations, we chose to make an up-driven game which would combine the traditional cardboard approach with electronic submarine simulation. It was a very ambitious undertaking, and we often found that we had to come up with never-before-seen solutions, which on the one hand is exciting, but on the other hand doesn't make things any easier. However, given the response of the community and the critics, it seems that we managed to deliver a game that we can be proud of. We would like to thank the voters one more time, and we hope that Iron Wolf Studio will deliver many more worthwhile games in the future. I've only learned two days ago, and here I am, sitting here in front of two cameras and a PC uh, that I have a bunch of notes and you hopefully don't see. Best war game of the year. Charlie has always been a recommendation for me when I was looking for games, and uh, when I have heard Ubot got one, I was very glad. There are many war games and great war games published every year, so Upod getting a one, that's something. When Charles S. Roberts designed a hex grid, he became a pioneer of modern war game and in general board game industry. He set an example to dream big and to trust intuition. The design of vision is taking us on unforgettable journey full of quick decisions. There is innovation in the presentation and the delivery, and above all, in players' experience. That thanks to a 3D submarine with a great table presence and a supportive app. But in fact, Ubot is just a few small and crowded rooms deep underwater. The 3D model and the app helped to create the immersion to help to understand what was the reality of living on a submarine during the World War II as much immersion as the board game can offer. This is the first real-time underwater war thriller, or rather quite claustrophobic role-playing game about personal war experience. I hope you all will have great fun playing Ubot and all other games from Phalanx. Thank you. Wow, what a great show. I enjoyed it, I hope you did too. Thank you for watching. We'll give a special thanks to all of our presenters and recipients who took time out of their day to participate in this show. We will also thank the voters because you are the ones who decided these awards. The top vote getters for each category is the winner and the next four are the considered nominees. So these awards are really chosen by the people. They're not chosen by any special committee, but by you, the voters. Thank you. And lastly, if you have any questions about the Charles S. Roberts Awards or wish to contact us, you can email us at charlessrobertsawards at gmail Com. And finally, I'd like to give a special thanks and shout out to Dan Pencaldi of the No Enemies Here podcast. Dan produced and directed the 2020 Charles S. Roberts Awards. Thank you, Dan. And thank you all for watching. Hope to see you again next year.
Dan, are you still wearing that beep in t-shirt?